for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Church is a great place for ongoing relationships and ongoing um, spiritual growth and, and recovery to happen. AA starts with talking about who our higher power is. Um, I think most of us in this church recognize that that's our Lord Jesus um, and God the Father. We're all broken and we're all um, hurting in some capacity. And so um, whatever it is that you're trying to find um, reconciliation and peace from, this church feels very loving and gentle in just the right way. And it's, it seems to be everything you need at the time you need it. To be free is to realize I am connected. Being a branch connected to the vine, to allow the Holy Spirit to be flowing through me, that's very real and very present. If you're gonna be a sober person, um, you really have to embrace God as you understand God. and. Um, that really opens a lot of eyes and opens a lot of hearts. You know, God will not be stopped. We continue to uh, offer programs for individuals, couples, men, women, families, all in an attempt to just create environments for people to come and find the love of Jesus, his goodness, and how he really does heal and help us. So I really Hope you'll join us in one form or another. Welcome to Recovering Love Church, everyone. I'm Pastor Brad Herman, one of the ministers here, and I want to welcome those who are with us, joining us via Facebook, as well as those who are here uh, live. Appreciate you being here. We have a wonderful service planned today, with, um, which includes communion and uh, also an opportunity to begin to explore step nine, our principle for the month, which is justice. And today's scripture is, for God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. For he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just, and he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. Isn't that good news? And so during the week, we'll, our portable practice, that's something we hope you'll be doing throughout the week to practice justice and as it's applied to this scripture. So as you make amends, consider the ways God has loved and forgiven you as a way to love and forgive others. As a married man, I, I, that's a great um, principle to practice, I'll tell you. So. But that'll be a good way for us to start the month off in um, living these amends and being peacemakers and part of God's justice. I'm going to um, do a prayer just to begin our worship service, and then Tim and Jay are going to lead us in our opening song. So welcome, everyone. Let's begin our time in worship. Holy and just and gracious and merciful and creative and loving God, we come before you with grateful hearts, thanking you for a chance to worship you, a chance to express our gratitude to you for, for forgiveness, for your mercy, for our lives as saved people and people in recovery. We thank you, God, for all you've done to this day, and we trust you in the future, too. And we open ourselves, Lord, to you in this time so that our worship would be acceptable to you, 
our worship would really be a reflection of our, our hope and our happiness in you and that you would be pleased. So hear us now, God, as we begin to worship Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's stand and uh, sing. Amen. Thanks, Pastor Brad. Yeah, let's stand. Welcome to Recovering Love Church. Step down into darkness, open my eyes, let me see beauty that made this heart adore you, hope of a life spent with you. Here I am to worship, and here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. of all days, oh, so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all for us sake we came poor. To worship, and here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. It costs to see my sin upon that cross. I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that he, oh my God. Good evening. I'm Brad Johnston. I'm a basketball fan and I've played it all my life and watch a lot of it. And so I was very gratified when I found this quote. There was a uh, NBA final this last season in 2021, and it was won by the Milwaukee Bucks. And on their journey to that championship, in an interview, the star of the Milwaukee Bucks was posed a question uh, by a reporter, and I wanted to quote to you his response. I figured out the mindset to have. When you focus on the past, that is your ego. When you focus on the future, that is your pride. And I try to focus on the moment, the present. That's humility. That is being humble, enjoying the game and competing at a high level. That's a skill I've tried to perfect and master. That's from Giannis Antetokounmpo. So this is a quote that I find also very relevant to me, both in living every day and living with the Holy Spirit. Busyness, the affliction of busyness and my movements between order and chaos with a daily 
frequency with a common denominator being self. This was always a constant in my past. And I'm walking around saying, who was I? Was I liked enough? Was I strong enough? Was I effective enough? And also questioning, well, who do I want to be? My pride. Fearing myself, perhaps, that I couldn't be what I wanted to be. Fearing the judgment of others. And maybe even fearing God. In coming in contact with AA and confronting my alcohol addiction, I stopped running around just enough for a little while to look at Jesus as Zacchaeus may have looked at Jesus in Jericho. And Jesus, too, invited me to a meal. And when he addressed me at my home, my spiritual home, Jesus provided me with three fundamental needs or truths of the spiritual life. The first was recognition. That I'm not the sum of my selfish behavior and acts of ego and pride in the past, but he recognized me as a child of God. Happiness, pure joy, his truth, this truth, brought happiness and joy to my life, not fear or shame that came from the battling of chaos and order and selfish pursuit. And finally, fruitfulness. Seeing that God's moves in the present moment while the game is being played at a very high level out in the world. But what of my past ways? What of my, um, the wake that I left in my path uh, and the continuous traversing around self and between chaos and order? What of my ego? Well, here I'd like to turn for a moment to today's scripture where God, through Jesus, reveals his divine law and moral authority. Romans 3, verse 25. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. God presents Jesus to me in this scripture, along with the cross, as the representation of overcoming suffering and experiencing transformation. Transformation from a prison of fear to a house of love. Transformed and free. God showed me his divine law and his moral order by providing me hope in the present moment. He chose to be fair and just with me. He enables me to live life and play the game with him at a high level in the present. And that is a skill I hope to master. Thanks, Brad, great job. Just as I am. There we go. Perfect. An old, an oldie with a twist. Uh, can we stand for this one too, please? Blood was shed for me and 
thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Just as I am, though tossed about with many a conflict, many a doubt, the fighting and fierce within, without, O oh, Lamb of God, I come, I come. Oh, just as I am, oh, I come. Oh, just as I am. as I am, Thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve, because I promise I believe, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Just as I am, oh, I come, oh, just as I am, oh, Lamb of God, I come, oh, Lamb of God, I come. Tonight's paired reading comes from the book of Romans, chapter 3, verses 25 and 26, and as Bill sees it, page 51. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. When I was driven to my knees by alcohol, I was made ready to ask for the gift of faith. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past, for he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time. And all was changed. Never again my pains and promise, I'm sorry, <laughs> never again my pains and problems notwithstanding would I experience my former desolation. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness for he himself is fair and just and he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. I saw the universe to be lighted by God's love. I was alone no more. Thank you, that was beautiful. I want to, uh, we're gonna introduce today's uh, scripture by showing you a video that introduces you to the book Romans. Paul wrote Romans and uh, it's, it's about a five minute video, but it's really well done. It's from the Bible Project. You can look up any book of the Bible. So you put Bible Project, one word, and then the book of the Bible, and they do these great graphics. Here's, here's one of them, go ahead. Paul's letter to the Romans. It's one of the longest and most significant things ever written by the man who was formerly known as Saul of Tarsus. He was a Jewish rabbi belonging to a group known as the Pharisees, and he was passionate and devout to the Torah of Moses and the traditions of Israel. And he saw Jesus and his followers as a threat. But then he had a radical encounter with the risen Jesus, who commissioned him as an apostle, like an official representative, to the world of non-Jewish people called Gentiles in the Bible. And so he started going by his Roman name, Paul, and he traveled all around the ancient Roman Empire telling people about the risen King Jesus and forming his followers then into these new communities called churches. 
And Paul would occasionally write letters to these new Jesus communities to help them foster their faith or answer questions. And the book of Romans is one of these. It was actually written quite late in his career. Now we know from the book of Acts that the church in Rome had existed for some time, that it was made up of Jewish and non-Jewish followers of Jesus. But at one point, the Roman emperor Claudius had expelled all of the Jewish people from Rome. And then about five years later, all of those Jews, including Jesus following Jews, were allowed to return. And when they did, they found a church that had become very non-Jewish in custom and practice. And so this created lots of tension. So that by Paul's day, the Roman church was divided. People disagreed about how to follow Jesus. They were debating about whether non-Jewish Christians should celebrate the Sabbath or eat kosher or be circumcised. And so Paul wrote this letter to accomplish a few things. He wanted this divided church to become unified and for a practical purpose. He was hoping that the Roman church could become a staging ground for his mission to go even further west all the way to Spain. And so these circumstances are what motivated Paul to write out his fullest explanation of the gospel, the good news that he was announcing about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Now the letter is designed to have four main movements, but it's unified as one long flowing exploration of the gospel. The gospel, Paul says, first of all, reveals God's righteousness, and then it also creates a new humanity, which fulfills God's promise to Israel. And so it's this gospel that's going to unify the church. In this video, we're just going to explore the ideas in chapters 1 through 4. So Paul opens by introducing himself as an apostle appointed by God to spread the gospel about Jesus, how he's the Messiah of Israel who was raised from the dead as the Son of God, King of the nations. And Jesus now calls all humanity to come under his loving rule. And Paul says this good news about King Jesus is, first of all, God's power to save people who trust in him, and second, that it reveals God's righteousness. Now, Righteousness is a rich Old Testament word for Paul. It describes God's character, that he always does justice, what is right and what is good, but also that he is faithful and just to fulfill his promises. And Paul's saying that the story of Jesus shows how God has done both of these things. How? Well, he goes first into a long creative retelling of Genesis chapters 3 through 11. He shows how all the Gentile world, all the nations, have become trapped in the spiral of sin and selfishness. The human heart and mind are broken, Paul says. We've turned away from God to embrace idolatry, which means finding ultimate significance in created things and then giving ultimate allegiance to these things that are not God. This results in a distortion of our humanity and destructive behavior. And so what's left is a humanity that stands guilty as charged before a just and righteous God. To which the people of Israel might say, well, it's a good thing then that God chose our people out from among the nations. He saved us out of slavery in Egypt. He gave us the laws of the Torah, like the Sabbath and eating kosher and circumcision. And these all together show us how to live as God's holy people. But, Paul says, not so fast. He recalls the storyline of the Torah and of the rest of the Old Testament, which shows that Israel was just as sinful and idolatrous and morally broken as the rest of humanity. Israel is actually more guilty than the Gentiles, Paul says, because they have the Torah. They should know better. And so, Paul concludes, all humanity, Gentiles, Israelites, are hopelessly trapped and guilty before God. But that is not the final word. The good news about Jesus is God's response. Instead of holding humanity guilty, Jesus came as Israel's Messiah to die on behalf of all people as a sacrifice for sins. As our representative, Jesus took into himself all of the just consequences of the pain, the sin, and the death that we have caused in the world. And he overcame it all by his resurrection from the dead. It's his new resurrection life that he makes available to others. Jesus became what we are so that we might become what he is. And all of this, Paul says, is how God justifies those who trust or have faith in Jesus. Now, well, that, Paul's uh, I know that was a lot, but uh, I thought it might be helpful since tonight's scripture picks up in that third chapter of Romans, which is explaining this, the works of Jesus, some call it the efficacy uh, the works of Jesus and how that affects us. 
and they read this way, for God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past, for he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just, and he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. I don't know if that simplified things. It can get really complex, this salvation st stuff. But, but what I want you to do is look at that and think about we're on step nine. And step nine is what? May direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so, would injure them or others. We just finished step eight, which was we made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. So when we're talking about amends, whether it's our list, as we consider the wrongs we've done to others, and what it might take to mend the relationship. And in step nine, we talk about making those amends, going directly to those people we had harmed with our attempt to right the wrongs. In a way, we can look at the coming of Jesus Christ as God's desire to make amends with humanity, both Gentiles and Jews, both of whom were seen as um, hopeless and lost, broken and unable to follow God's laws or do right by God. And it's just, for me, it's just this wonderful thought because <clears throat> as someone who's, who has known Christ, who committed a life to Christ and the church, who took vows, and knew full well what I was getting into, well, not always, not fully, <laughs> what I was getting to, when I said yes to ordain ministry, but to having, you know, wanted, really, I wanted to serve God faithfully. I wanted to do right. I wanted to be faithful to God's word, to the people I served, but there was this problem, and that is I'm alcoholic, that I loved to drink. And I, there was a part where I, I stopped loving to drink, but I still kept drinking because I, I couldn't stop. I had lost all control and power over that. And, and that, that addiction, that powerlessness over alcohol and, and the unmanageability that ensued made it very obvious that I was, there was nothing I could do to make my life right before God. And, and I, I was in that position where either I commit suicide and just say, I, it's too depressing, I can't do this. I have failed so badly, or I begin to trust something other than my behavior. If I look at my behavior, I have no hope. Not only my behavior, but if I look at my condition, I have no hope. The condition is the thing where we say, it's not just my conduct, that's just an expression of my condition. I mean, the Pharisees, why was Jesus angry with them? It's because they were self-righteous. They said, my conduct makes me right. And Jesus said, no, 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 it makes you self-righteous and arrogant, and your heart is hardened, and you don't understand those people who want to get right with me, but can't. And, and he said, your condition, he says, you're like whitewashed tombs. You're all white on the outside, but in, inside you're dead. Boy, I know that one. And so when we look at God making amends to humanity through Jesus Christ, we, we begin to explore this. If you look at the cross, when you begin to explore what it means, what did Jesus do on the cross, and how did it affect us? When I was uh, at another church, I did a youth, um, I had to do the children's sermon, and that was difficult, trying to, you know, communicate these complex uh, ideas to, to children was really good for me. And one of the things was, I said, um, I had one of those little b small basketballs. Brad played basketball, I grew up playing hockey. And I said, there's a basket, and I said, um, how many of you guys believe I can make a basket? 
you know, and about half the kids raised their hands. And I said, okay, those of you who believe I can make a basket, stand over here. Those who don't believe in me, that I can make a basket, stand over here. And then I said, now, before I shoot the basket, I want to give you one more chance. If I make the basket and you believe that I can make the basket, you get to go to heaven. If, I, if you believe in me and I don't make the basket, that's it. Who wants to stay in the line? Who believes I can make the basket? All of a sudden, my behavior, I mean, is in fact affecting their life. And that for me is when I look at the cross and I say, okay, God, I've tried to be righteous on my own. I, I really have. I, I went to seminary in a time where there was a lot of openness to different ways, different voices about what it means to, to know God and to live a faithful life. And it really challenged me on a lot of fronts and it was very disturbing, honestly. I could not sit comfortably in, in, in a certain way of believing. I was challenged every week by either a professor or a student or life itself. And so when you look at, there, anybody familiar with the atonement theories? Atonement is that word at one mint. It's what, how God becomes one, reconciles that relationship, makes amends to us. Did you know there's just a bunch of atonement theories about what happened on the cross? I mean, I, there's the subjective view and moral influence theory. There's the atonement as victory theory. There's Anselm's satisfaction therapy, theory. There's the penal substitution therapy, or therapy, substitution. There's the sacrifice theory. And then there's the, even the government theory, the God's kingdom. It, 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 I've got an explanation of all these if you're at all interested in it, but just look up theories on atonement. You think, oh, it's an easy thing. Jesus died for my sins and he took the, the penalty that I was supposed to get the penalty that I was supposed to get, he took for me. Well, that's the penal, that's the punishment one, where instead of I, my being punished by an angry God, Jesus takes the punishment. The sacrifice one is the one Paul's talking about, which is rooted in that Old Ten Testament cult about sacrificing animals to atone for sins. Not mentioned was the, the scapegoat that is a part of the Jewish atonement, where they put, the priest puts the sins of the people for the whole year on the goat, and then they send the goat out into the desert. Scapegoat. But there's no death with the goat. They just send him out. I don't know, you wonder if he comes back. It's like, stay away! You know? But, but I just share this because when you look at this scripture up here, it says, when God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin, that tells you that it's, it's the sacrifice theory. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. It's, it follows the Passover lamb, uh, the, the way the Israelites, or the Israelites were saved from the angel of death at the Passover by putting lamb's blood on the lintels of their doors. And the angel of death passed over, uh, sparing the uh, firstborn male children and animals. And then for the Egyptians, it took them on. So it's Jesus' blood that sa saves us. That sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. That is, the Jews who were faithful before Jesus came and looking ahead and including them in what would be he do in this present time, including for us. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness for he himself is fair and just, and he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. I mean, does, is that helpful? Or I think for me, where I land on this is that, for me, God's justice is best known by the grace that he expressed through Jesus. Not only the crucified Jesus, but the the Jesus who was born uh, in a stable and whose parents cared for him and who began to speak the truth about God 
uh, at a young age, the Jesus who was God in the flesh, who said, I come with good news. I am declaring that the kingdom of God is here. The Jesus who, I mean, if it was about punishment, I don't think Jesus would have ever had that conversation with the woman at the well. I think if it was about punishment, I don't think the woman who was caught in the act of adultery would have uh, escaped stoning. I think if it was about punishment, uh, the uh, tax collector would have never been invited. Matthew would have never been invited to follow him. I mean, you just think about, because we remember Jesus forgave sins before he went to the cross. Remember that? The paralytic was lowered down by his friends, and Jesus said, which is easier to do? Say to this man, pick up your mat and walk, or I forgive your sins. And Jesus goes, so you know that I, whose authority I have and why I'm here? I say to you, your sins are forgiven. And then he goes, now take up your mat and walk. So Jesus, I, I just think the grace of God and the mercy of God, we know that that, that triumphs his judgment. That's what we believe I do as a Christian, as an alcoholic who screwed up so bad, there was no way I could go with my own works to make me good before God. And he knew me. I'm such a control freak. He knew I needed to really screw up. So he could say, I want to make sure you know that I love you. I loved you when you were passed out on those rocks behind that gas station at 2 in the afternoon when you were awakened by a female cop and there were people gathered around. I want you to know I loved you there, Brad. Isn't that something? So for me, it's grace is like you draw a line in the sand and you want everything perfect and then the wind comes, the Holy Spirit comes and it blows everything and you lose track of where the line is and where God's at work and where I start and it's just this wonderful, crazy experience of love that says, let's start with my love for you and then we'll go from there. And so as we prepare to enter in this time of making amends, I invite you to to explore again how God has made amends with you through his son Jesus. Whatever way that comes. Uh, the book of Romans is a great one. It, it, I encourage you to read that. It's beautiful. Uh, there are others that are good too. But, um, but to begin, as we look at this notion of justice, I, I have to look at God's grace. And um, so I, we're going to be, uh, I'm going to consecrate the elements. Rick's going to come up and lead us in a time of silent meditation and preparation to receive communion. And then um, you'll be invited to come up for that. But right now I want to just share these ancient words around communion. They begin this way. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he had promised he would be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. And so we remember that on the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, he broke the bread, and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you, this is my blood of the new covenant 
poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, God, I ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. And by your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Rick? Thanks, Brad. My name is Rick. I'm on the prayer and meditation team. Tonight, we're going to provide a meditation experience and a time for contemplation as a way to prepare for communion. The meditation tonight will have a couple of phases. The first phase is the reading of the scripture. The second phase is spending time in silence, prayer, and contemplation about the scripture. In the final phase, I'll offer a closing prayer. The silence is intended to promote communion with God and increase the knowledge of his word. To sit in silence takes practice. Be kind to yourself as you enter into this practice. Silence is one of the most essential aspects for building a growing relationship with God. One of the most valuable things that we can do is to relax and embrace the reading of his holy word into our heart. Be with God and simply sit in his presence and feel his tender love. We'll be meditating in silence. I'm sure you all have a cell phone. Just take a moment to turn the ringer off so um, that we can create a space where we will be undisturbed. We'll be reading the Bible verse twice. Tonight's reading will be Romans 3, 25 through 26. After the reading, a bell will ring to begin the silence and will ring again at the end of the contemplation. Thank you for being here. We are entering into a time of meditation. Pay attention to your breathing. As you breathe in, invite the Holy Spirit to open you and help you be receptive to God's word. As you breathe out, let go of anything that keeps you from truly hearing the gifts of insight. As you breathe in, feel the light of the Spirit surround your heart, mind, and body. As you breathe out, let go of anything that keeps you from being present to the scripture. Invite the Spirit to guide you at this time. Our reading today comes from Romans 3, 25 and 26. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. For he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he is fair and just, and he makes sinners right in his sight as they believe in Jesus. And again, for God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right when God, when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. For he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just, and he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. We will now begin our silent meditation.
I will now offer a closing prayer. God, you've shown us what is good, to act just and do what is fair to others. Lord, we know you loved us even when we were wrong, that your grace is the highest form of justice, for you sent your son Jesus with forgiving love, and he offered a way for us when the world had shut us out. Open our hearts to the needs of others, of all different types of people in this world, and lead us in humble service towards one another with love and tolerance as our code. May we be instruments in your hands and bring your kingdom of justice and peace everywhere we go. In Jesus' name, amen. JR is going to play uh, some instrumental music. You're welcome to come up and receive the elements. Uh, there's uh, gluten-free in the center. You just grab some bread and some juice, and there'll be a basket available for the cups afterwards. So uh, come up when you're ready. I want you to know uh, it's, we're going to take our offering now. Uh, you're in an obligation to give, but uh, Wendy will be coming around, and um, we're just grateful you're here, and thank you for your faith. Wendy. Thank you, JR. I want to invite Anne forward now for our time of shared prayer and unison Lord's Prayer. Okay. 
We are now entering into a time for those who would like to respond to the message by offering a prayer or a scripture. This is a beautiful way to lift our hearts in prayer or offer a fitting scripture as a way to further support today's message. For those of you here in person and would like to pray and, or offer a scripture, remain in your seat, raise your hand, and Dave, will bring you a wireless mic. And for those of you live streaming, you can pray silently or via chat. And then I'll conclude our time in prayer and share with a short prayer of my own and then invite all of us to pray the Lord's Prayer. Let us begin our time together. Standing, standing by with the mic, just please raise your hand. I'll come to you. Yes, Dave, help me. Hmm. Dear God, I ask that you would be with our friend David and our friend Allie, that they would feel your love, your presence, and strength and that they would seek you mm. in their days, in their ways. Amen. Father, I'd like to ask that you keep our teachers, our students, bus drivers and support staff and people safe as many of us have sent them back off to school. Some will be just starting school next week, but we know that um, they're all under your love, care, and protection, and we thank you for that. Thank you for your prayers, said in silence or spoken. Father, I just too want to join the hearts here and thank you for um, your great, great love and grace and mercy. I pray that you would empower all of us to just love each other as you have loved us, to have the courage to, to, um, by your spirit to make direct amends because of the way that you have loved us and uh, have forgiven us. So may your spirit and your love help us all this week to um, go forth and thank you that you, you only require us to, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with you, Lord. So we, um, we now will join our hearts and say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that have trespassed against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Amen. How about we stand for the closing song here? And how about uh, JR, everyone? Tim. Everyone, thank you. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus What can make me whole again? Nothing
nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Oh, no other fountain, no. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Oh, no other fountain, no. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Now by this I'll overcome. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Now by this I'll reach my home. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fountain, no. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. sing nothing but the blood of Jesus all my praise for this I bring nothing but the blood of Jesus oh precious is the flow that makes White as snow, no other fountain, no, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Could you have a seat real quick? I want to invite Jim and Julie McAleese up just for a quick announcement. Jim and Julie uh, do a lot for this church, bear a lot of fruit. Go ahead. Just a really fast announcement. We'd like to say that we've been married 56 years, and there's good news and bad news. The good news is if it, we can make it, anybody can. The bad news is we find we have to work on our marriage as much today as we ever have in our life. We're doing a program um, called Reengage. It's a 16-week program that we'll be doing this fall, and we would like to make that available to the entire congregation of Recovering Love Church. Do I look like a homeless person? If you're, if well, you are, I want you to call me. If you are interested in joining us in this uh, program, we would ask you to either call us or let uh, Brad know or somebody in the church. We'll follow we up. We couldn't We've, figure out how to get the Zoom audience we, involved. We begin so next week. You. So if you're interested, please let us know right, right away. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Yep. Um, why don't you stand? We're going to do our closing prayer. Uh, just want you to know we're collecting items for Simpson Housing Services. If you have any questions about that, see Heather. Is that okay, Heather? Yeah, she's... But... Uh, 
and then um, there'll be a video at, after all this if you want to stick around on uh, our retreat we're planning October 8th through 10th at Cronus, Lake Cronus. So. But join me in this prayer for justice. O oh, gracious God, enlarge my heart with memories of ways you have shown love, mercy, and compassion towards me. Open and soften my heart as I recall those I have harmed and seek to heal what I have broken in them and in our relationship. Make me aware of how much you love those I have harmed. Help me to do your will in all the ways I relate to others. I ask this in Jesus' name. And now I send you, and join me now in our blessing, our benediction. It's our version of step one, uh, and I think it's somewhere. Well, I'll tell it to you. We're powerless over the fact that God loves us, and God's love for us is unmanageable. Thank you. I wanted to make sure you're aware of this exciting upcoming event, the first ever fall retreat for Recovering Love Church. It's going to be October 8th, that's a Friday, through Sunday, October 10th at about noon. We'll be at Camp Coronas in wonderful Painesville, Minnesota on Lake Coronas. Really nice hotel style accommodations with that log cabin camp feel. It's going to be a wonderful, really nice opportunity for us to gather in faith and friendship for a great weekend. Singing around bonfires, doing meditation, working a little bit on step 10 since it's the 10th month. Really excited about gathering our people together for the experience. You can sign up after worship or go online for more information at www.recoveringlovechurch.com. Get excited! <laughs>